And welcome to The Verdict. I'm Kent Myers. We sure do appreciate you joining us again today for another edition of The Verdict. As you can probably tell, or you will be able to tell when we have a little wider shot, Mick Cornett's not here today. I'm sitting in for him and give you his regards, by the way. We're really pleased today to bring to you the Chief Law Enforcement Officer in the state of Oklahoma, the Attorney General Scott Pruitt. Scott's been on a number of times before telling us what's going on in Oklahoma in the area of both civil and criminal law enforcement. He's actively involved in a lot of things, and we're going to get a rather comprehensive report here in just a couple of minutes. But for now, let's take a quick break, see what our sponsors have to see and we will be back with you in just a minute. I've always been a public servant. I've served either tribes, I've served the federal government, or I've served state governments. The law allows me to express my natural desire to advocate. My name is Stephanie Cochran. I am an attorney and I am Chickasaw. Lawyers give their clients, and in my case, tribal governments, a voice. I and mean, it's through legal decisions that tribes have been able to accomplish and to regain some much lost footing that they encountered in the late 1800s and the 1900s. When I reflect back on this time in history, I think I'll look at it in terms of opportunity. And I think now we have to turn those opportunities into long-term success for our future generations. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. We're back. As I indicated in the opening segment, we are genuinely pleased to be able to present to you today the Honorable Scott Pruitt, the Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma. This is Scott's seventh appearance on The Verdict, and he keeps us, he comes on from time to time to keep us well informed about what's going on in the office and what's going on criminally and civilly within our state. Scott uh, did his undergraduate work at Georgetown College in Kentucky, did his law work at the University of Tulsa, served in the state Senate as a leader in the state Senate as a Republican uh, for eight years. Uh, he, uh, for a year or two, was also the general manager of the Oklahoma City Redhawks, which is where I first became acquainted with Scott, and he first appeared in that capacity on our show. Uh, he uh, is in charge of running one of the biggest law firms in the state of Oklahoma, the Office of the Attorney General. And we're really pleased that he has uh, chosen to join us today. Scott, welcome back. It's good to be with you, Ken. Good to see you. I remember those baseball times where we'd get together, we'd talk about hot dogs. Well, that, we, now we're talking about the law. That's well, good. we yeah, did. Yeah. The, the only thing I don't like about that is that you haven't aged a bit. Oh, that's not true at all, yeah, but you thank look you. The they, same. You're very kind to say that. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Scott, I want to start our discussion today talking about the water settlement that got a lot of publicity recently, and uh, I wish you'd outline for our viewers uh, just what was involved, what, was the, what were the major issues? You know, water litigation typically, Kent, when you look across the country, uh, takes decades. In fact, the average time is, is more than 20 to 30 years. And so for us to begin this journey in August of 2011, that's when the state of Oklahoma was sued by the Chickasaw Nation and the Choctaw Nation with respect to tw a 22 county area involving a water basin there in southeast Oklahoma. Uh, initially the lawsuit was about uh, the tribe's belief that they owned the water in that area, meaning that they had all permitting authority, all authority with respect to environmental regulations and, and, and the rest. Uh, and, and five years later, uh, to settle this lawsuit in the time frame that we did, and I think achieve principles that each party uh, was concerned about uh, is a very, very, uh, I think, historical uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, tip, uh, the, the state of Oklahoma maintained its permitting authority. It, it maintained its position as the arbiter of how water is allocated in the state of Oklahoma. Right now that's done through the Oklahoma Water Resources Board. That remains constant. What has changed is that the, the nations, both the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations, now have a voice in that process that they did not have before. Uh, there's an advisory committee that's been established 
technically related uh, to address out of basin uh, transfers that could occur in the future. And then there's some conservation measures that were incorporated into uh, the settlement with respect to lake level, uh, uh, lake levels uh, there at Sardis, as well as in-stream flow with respect to the Kayamichi. And so we have, I think, some conservation measures that we built into the agreement, plus a voice in the process uh, that did not exist before, but the state maintained its authority over allocating the water in the future. Now, the state was a party to this case. The two tribes you've mentioned were uh, involved in the case as well. And so there were some municipalities. Where the so was the city of Oklahoma City. You're city, right. They were yeah. a major uh, par party to the to the settlement and to the to the litigation. And as you know, the uncertainty with respect to their permit uh, mm -hmm. that they had secured through the Oklahoma Water Resources Board. Uh, was in was in question, and so this was very important to provide regulatory certainty to existing permit holders like the city of Oklahoma City, uh, but other permit holders across the state. And any time that you have water litigation, Kent, uh, it creates great disruption uh, potentially in mm -hmm. with those that have existing permits, but all the, also those that want to get permits in the future. And Oklahoma City was no different. I mean, they had 120 acre feet, as I recall, 120,000 acre feet of, of water that was in question. Uh, it's not just about Oklahoma City, it's about the metro area. Uh, that water serves Shawnee uh, and, and communities all around the central Oklahoma area. So this was very, very important to get certainty uh, for this part of the state, southeast Oklahoma, but also the entire state. Because what we've built into this agreement, uh, Kent, is a forward-looking uh, resolution that if the state ever changes its position on out-of-state sales uh, to Texas, people that want to purchase water from, te from Oklahoma, that the entire state would benefit, not just regions of Oklahoma, but the entire state. So this is something I think that we built for the long term. Uh, right now, as you know, the sale of water is not permitted. There's a moratorium on that. Uh, and we don't even know if that's possible in the future. But we tried to, as part of every good transaction, uh, build into the future uh, certain decisions that could occur. Where was this case pending? Uh, the Western District of Oklahoma before, mm. before Judge West in the federal court. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me as somebody who's been involved in the litigation process for a while, uh, that this is an exceptionally fine result because it shows the goodwill and the spirit of folks who have competing interests to come together and reach a compromise. Can you comment on, on that aspect of it? Yeah, look, this water litigation by definition is complex. And then yep. when, you, when you add to the, the water litigation component uh, tribal law, uh, the federal jurisdiction of the Interior Department, their, their role uh, in a, affirming this process, you have many parties, many voices, and so to manage that process over five years and achieve, I think, this historical outcome, uh, we should all be proud of that. And I think you hit on something very important. The goodwill, the commitment, the perseverance that it took by all litigants, the state of Oklahoma, the Chickasaw and Choctaw Nations, the city of Oklahoma City, each with varying interests and needs, uh, coming to the end uh, and having principles met uh, was very, very key. Well, I think sometimes that's very hard to achieve, and, and I think all parties to that uh, agreement are to be congratulated on bringing it to a successful conclusion. There's still steps to occur. Congress still has to affirm uh, the agreement. It's almost like a compact that has mm -hmm. to be affirmed by Congress. The legislature here in Oklahoma doesn't have a role, but, but the, the Congress does, and the Interior Department uh, will make its voice heard as we've you know, solicited throughout the entire process. So you have an executive branch uh, component and a, a legislative branch component still to, to take place, but we're confident that that will, that will occur. You have, the expectation is it will be approved. That's, that's my expectation. Yeah. I, I want to change subject, if we may. Um, some of us are, are aware of a recent uh, United States Supreme Court decision involving North Carolina dentists, where a group of North Carolina dentists who were participating in the dental board uh, had an issue with allowing non-dentists to perform uh, teeth whitening procedures. And the Supreme Court set forth some very uh, difficult uh, rules to follow. Uh, I know your office has been on the forefront of bringing Oklahoma into line with that decision. Can you describe that briefly for us? Yeah, the decision was actually from 2015, and you're right, there were some teeth whitening services that, that were taking place in North Carolina at the local mall. And uh, the board there in North Carolina, uh, the Board of Dentistry, was actually populated by a majority of market participants, uh, dentists. And so uh, when they issued these regulations and actually fined these individuals, uh, the individuals that were providing the teeth whitening services sued. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. 
And the Supreme Court uh, issued a ruling that I thought was very, very key. It, it said that, that if a border commission at the state level is populated by a majority of market participants, it can engage in anti-competitive conduct. Mm -hmm. And as such, there needs to be some state oversight to ensure that the state interest is the focus of the decision and not uh, market advancement by those market participants that are on the border commission. And so we set up a process, Kent, uh, uh, to, to overlook and oversee agency action in Oklahoma, most of our boards and commissions, as you know, are populated by market participants, whether it's den the dental board, the nursing board, uh, others. Uh, and so we have this review process now to ensure that as they make decisions, disciplinary and otherwise, uh, that they're doing so with a safety and health, a state interest component and it's not about advancing any one member or any, uh, I guess, collection yeah. of market participants, market participants' interest above the states. The reason that's important, as you know, is that if that's not done according to the Supreme Court decision, those participants on the Board of Commission uh, actually lose their antitrust protection. Yes. And so this was a very important step, one of a kind in the country. We were the first in, this, in the country to do this, and right now still the only uh, eight office attorney general in the state that's providing this service. Well, how are other states react, if, if you know from your... Uh, very slow. Yeah. Very slow, and, and I think... Well, that's it, pretty risky, isn't it? It's hugely, uh, it, uh, very much a risk. In fact, what we did initially is send an, a letter to the governor once this decision came out and said, look, there needs to be some process defined, an ombudsman, someone internal to the governor's office. Uh, the governor actually responded to my letter by saying, well, you can do it, uh, Mr. Attorney General. So, yeah. so that, that process, I actually spend each week, I'll have dozens of these on my desk every week that I'm reviewing personally and that I sign off on personally, and we've assigned attorneys in my office overseeing all of these decisions by these boards and commissions that are then submitted to me. Well, approximately since that has been implemented, how many different uh, boards or agency decisions have, has your office looked at? Oh, at least in the hundreds, and I think yeah. probably, I would say probably over a thousand. Well, it's, uh, and you haven't hired new staff to do it. I no, take sir. It. You're using no, sir. existing resources. That's exactly right. That's pretty cheap insurance, Scott. I believe so. Congratulations Thank to you. you. We're going to have to jump to a break here, and we'll be right back. Uh, we are visiting with uh, the Honorable Scott Pruitt, the Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma, and we're finding out uh, what's going on in the Attorney General's office and in Oklahoma. You're watching The Verdict. We'll be right back. comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma, loyal to you. Welcome back. We're talking with the Honorable Scott Pruitt, the Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma, about a number of different topics. Scott, uh, uh, I'd like to now shift gears if we can. I know that your office has been uh, engaged uh, with the EPA from time to time on Environmental Protection Agency regulations. Can you bring our viewers uh, kind of up to speed on what's going on there? I think, I think engage is the right word. <laughs> uh, we've had many opportunities to engage the EPA. In fact, w b before I get into the cases, I do want you to know that, that I've reached out to the general counsel at the EPA uh, in, the, in the past to deal with some concerns with respect to regulation through litigation. And, uh, and, and we try to maintain a dialogue with the EPA apart from, from uh, the adversarial posture of litigation. Uh, sometimes that's not noticed, sometimes that's not reported. We, we try to do both. But, but the EPA has taken some steps uh, of late, particularly when you look at uh, 2015 into 2016, uh, a number of regulations, uh, two that I'll mention for you today, that, that are very uh, far-reaching and we've had success at, 
at, at preventing their application in Oklahoma. One involves something, something called the Waters of the United States. Uh, it's it's a, a rule that was issued by the EPA out of the Clean Water Act uh, providing, as they indicated, clarification about what jurisdiction they have over regulating water across the country, and they redefine what constitutes a water of the United States. Uh, historically, legally, and within the context of the statute, for the EPA to have jurisdiction, a water had to be navigable, in fact. And that made sense because of the Interstate sure. Commerce Clause. Well, they changed the definition in the rule to say that so long as there was a nexus to navigability, uh, then, th then they were going to extend their jurisdiction. So, as you might imagine, that enlarged their, their scope quite a bit to include, and this is not an overstatement, dry creek beds in Altus, Oklahoma, uh, that were dry 90% of the year. So, any type of economic development, building subdivisions, oil and gas, farming and ranching, things that folks have been doing using their property for generations, the first stop for review was going to be the EPA uh, before they could uh, proceed and get a permit. So we sued along with 30 other states. We were lead, one of the lead litigants there. We were successful at uh, getting a, an, a stay against that rule, uh, Kent, uh, against the EPA, uh, and it provided certainty across the country. Uh, to, to private property owners, states, uh, local municipalities, and the use of, of private property and real property. Uh, huge case. And, and I think that case will be uh, in that posture until the, the new administration is sworn in uh, and we have a, a, a Supreme Court that's uh, maybe nine members. The other case that was very, very far-reaching was the Clean Power Plan, uh, the, the, the uh, rule that the President issued out of the climate action discussions that occurred in Paris, and then the EPA issued the Clean Power Plan, plan rule that went after power generation across the country. Is that and basically coal-fired? Is that what it's it's, it, it is, but, but it's, really, it's really more of a cap-and-trade type of approach without mm -hmm. the trade. It was, <laughs> it was using the, the Clean Air Act provisions in Section 112 uh, to say that we had to reduce our carbon footprint in Oklahoma by over 30 percent. Now, for a state like Oklahoma, uh, we already are in the top three in the country in the generation of electricity through wind. Uh, we generate about 17 percent approximately of our, all of our electricity through wind. So we're a very diversified uh, state insofar as how we generate electricity from natural gas uh, and, and, and coal and renewables like wind. So when, when the EPA comes to a state like Oklahoma and says, now reduce your carbon footprint by more than 30 percent, in light of us already being very diversified in the generation of electricity, where do you go? Well, it's reduced capacity. It's actually mm -hmm. decommissioning coal generation. It's not making it cleaner. It's shutting it down. It's and so cutting that, down electricity. Well, it's, it's, it's actually taking over. It's a power grab over the power grid, you know, yeah. by the EPA. Yeah. And, and so we, along with 26 other states, sued to say that they had exceeded their authority. The very last decision that Justice Scalia ever made as a Supreme Court Justice. The last week of his life, actually, he joined four other members of the U.S. Supreme Court to issue a stay against the EPA for the unlawfulness of this particular rule. Uh, we, along with West Virginia, led that effort. In fact, I estimated before we went into that, uh, it had never been done in history. The Supreme Court had, nev had never intervened and issued a stay at that point in the proceeding. Uh, we thought maybe there was a 15 or so percent chance of winning that. We won it. And so that was the last decision he made as a justice on the court. So we've had two major successes with respect to the excesses of the EPA. Well, do you have a <clears throat> particular segment of your office that specializes in such things? You know, we have a, a unit that I established after coming into office called the Federalism Unit that, yeah. that, that is a group of attorneys that, that are focused upon executive action, executive orders, rulemaking at the federal level, whether it's EPA or Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or HHS or whatever the agency. And so they typically handle all that litigation. Patrick Weirich, who's my solicitor, uh, as you know, Oklahoma had never had a solicitor general, yeah. uh, someone that kind of combined all appellate advocacy into one office. Uh, we were one of only 13 states that didn't have a solicitor when I came to office. Hmm. So I added him, created that position. He oversees that unit. Um, I've had occasion to uh, deal with Patrick from time to time, a very nice gentleman, he very is. competent lawyer. He's aged more than me, but he's doing pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you can run him pretty fast, Scott. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's talk just a little bit more about the EPA thing uh, and and the tie that, if you will, to the broader concept of federal overreach. I know that your office is concerned about federal overreach. Can you? Uh, you've briefly described it in relation to the EPA. EPA. Can you take it further? Well, I think I think what I would say first and foremost is it, it's not intended to be a policy statement. I think a lot of times litigation is interpreted to be a statement about policy, 
And, and I think that's an important distinction. It's not my job to, to say it's a good idea or a bad idea on whether we should have a climate action plan or, or you know, there should be some regulation of carbon under the Clean Air Act. That's a policy decision to be made by Congress. The, the beef that we have is that Congress has not made that decision. And you have executive agencies at the federal level filling in the space, you know, pinch hitting for the legislative branch and making those kind of determinations. And, and it happens all too often. I mean, this president, when he entered office, was very critical of the use of President Bush's executive orders up until that point about acting in, the, in place of Congress. I think he's gotten over it, and I, and I think he's gotten he's got a view of, of executive power. Now, look, I mean, if you're the president of the United States and Congress is is dysfunctional, then you're going to use the the full measure of authority that you have and have the courts tell you no. Uh, the courts have started telling him no, and and we've had a m immigration, waters in the United States, clean power plan, uh, mercury rule, the match rule. We've had many successes against. Uh, the president's overreach because he's tried to do the, the job of Congress. So part of the problem here is that Congress is not doing its job. You know, the founders believed that the branches would be jealous in guarding their authority, that they would be ambitious for their own authority that, that they possessed. When one branch of government checks out, which is what Congress has done, and doesn't legislate, uh, the executive branch will fill in the space, sometimes unlawfully and inconsistent with the Constitution. Scott, I want to change topics again, and excuse me for jumping around, there's just a lot that I'd like to ask you about. Uh, and <clears throat> this question is not uh, meant to be uh, in any way critical of any court in the state, but um, there's been pending now uh, for a long time, the Illinois River case, where the idea was that there was pollution going into the Illinois River, and that case has been fully tried, I think, right. and pending decision for a long time. Right. I don't know how long. You may. You well, may actually, know. before I came into office. Yeah. The case had been fully litigated and submitted to to uh, to the court before I was sworn in. The, is there any prospect that we'll get a decision anytime soon? You know, in there's that been case? a couple of there's been a couple of uh, motions that we have filed with the court to update the court on decisions that we thought were relevant to the yeah. court's decision, yeah. um, and and the other side has done that as well. So there's been sporadic and intermittent kind of uh, filings with the court. Uh, but beyond that, there's not been much activity. Uh, as you indicated, the, the full case had been litigated um, and submitted for decision uh, over six years ago. I uh, found that it's not good to continue to re uh, remind a judge that we're awaiting a decision. Sometimes they'll give you one fast that you don't want. So I guess it's wise to just sit and wait. You look, don't I have think, a lot of other alternatives. No, and I think, look, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Judge Frizzell's. I think Judge Frizzell is a very, very good jurist. He's a very good uh, judge. Uh, and, and their dockets are, as you might imagine, there's not been many judges being confirmed for appellate positions at the, at the national level. I'm not sure what their dockets look like at the, at the, at the local level for, for the Northern District of, of, of Oklahoma. But he's a good judge. Uh, I think he, he, he takes serious his responsibilities. Sure. Uh, we've tried to do our best to educate and inform the court as, as things have happened to, that may impact the decision. Uh, at this point, I don't see anything uh, that needs to be done to prompt that yeah. per se, but, but uh, who, who, there may be other steps. Well, we maybe this show will do it. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, final topic, we only have about a minute, minute and a half left. The future of the Supreme Court. Talk to our viewers about how you see the future of the Supreme Court. Look, I, I mean, I think that uh, when you look at what Justice Scalia represented on that court, he was a textualist and he was an originalist. And sometimes mm -hmm. people bridge those or merge those together. But from a textualist perspective, he actually believed that the text of the statute, the text of the Constitution, should govern the decision of the court. I think what you see with certain judges, as you know, is they look at some language and they say, well, we, we're going to divine the intent. Of, of the legislature and put our own stamp on what they meant by the words. I mean, Justice Scalia's approach was to let the words be what they are and, and be, be bound by them, but also to interpret them originally as was, you know, th those, would, those words would have been used at the time that the law was passed. That's a very important approach to how the court should do business in the future. I mean, we want to make sure that whomever replaces Justice Scalia 
is not someone that tries to fill up the Constitution or fill up statute with policy beliefs of their own. Judges aren't intended to do that. Judges are supposed to give meaning and life to the words that legislators put into a statute or the Constitution because they are an embodiment of the people and a representative of the people. So the system breaks down when the court becomes legislator. And I think we need someone on the court to ensure that that doesn't take place. I'm afraid that's going to be have to be our last word. You've been watching a show today with the Honorable Scott Pruitt, the Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma. We'll be right back. There are now 11 million of us who live here and work here. I was 15 when I came here six years ago. I raised my family here. I drive my truck to my job every day. The only difference between now and six years ago, I do illegally. I wanted to because this is my home. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. We are a very conservative family. And we believe in old-fashioned family values. We have a loving home there, and we love kids. And uh, we have five, six of our own. And uh, but I had no idea we were going to go into adoption. But we're, it's been very gratifying. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of the verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back. We just uh, finished a show with the Honorable Scott Pruitt, the Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma. I hope you enjoyed it. I found it very informative. He's always got an awful lot going on. I don't see how he keeps all those things uh, juggling in the air without dropping a ball, and he doesn't drop them as far as I can see. Uh, I've got a couple of websites to give you. If you want to get a hold of Scott, his website is www.okc.gov.org. Uh, and ours, of course, the verdict is theverdict.tv. We enjoy hearing from you. We do pay attention to that. And uh, thanks so much for watching today. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you next week. You've been watching The Verdict. Bye-bye.